Hello there and welcome to Tristero Pod episode 6. I'm David Colma, the other guy is Dorian Wallace. We're composers and we do talk about politics from a very leftist point of view and music here. So, how's it going today, Dorian? Oh, it's going well. Um, I wanted to, before we get into any music talks today, I really had some shocking news that I wanted to talk to you and to talk to all of our listeners about. Oh no, I'll be shocked. Yeah, it turns out Richard Spencer is a Nazi. (laughs) (laughs) So, 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 let's, let's just make sure everybody understands. That's news to no one. Go ahead. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, um... If it wasn't completely obvious that he's a Nazi, um, well, so it, it gets strange. Milo Yiannopoulos, just uh, either today, uh, and today is uh, November 5th, remember, remember the 5th of November, um, but uh, either today or yesterday released, uh, <laughs> released some audio recording of Richard Spencer hanging out and being angry with uh, some of his fellow white nationalist friends the day after the Unite the Right rally. Um, And I'm not going to use any of the slurs, though I will make a reference to one of them, but I just wanted to read (laughs) what he said. So you don't have to listen to him say it, because it is actually really uncomfortable to, like, listening to. We listen to... No, hold on a second. We listen to... We listen to to Nazis, so you don't have to. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, perfect. (laughs) Go ahead. So, so um, uh, there's an occasional audience member who yells, who applauds and yells, yeah, uh, during this. But So Richard Spencer says, we are coming back here like a hundred fucking times. I am so mad. I am so fucking mad at these people. They don't do this to fucking me. We are going to fucking ritualistically humiliate them. I am coming back here every fucking weekend if I have to. Like, this is never over. I win. They fucking lose. That's how the world fucking works. Little fucking slur for Jewish people that starts with a K. They get ruled by people like me. Little fucking, little fucking racial slur that is used for black people who are one-eighth black. I fucking... My ancestors fucking enslaved these little pieces of fucking shit. I rule the fucking world. These pieces of fucking shit get ruled by people like me. They look up and see a face like mine looking down at them. That's how the fucking world works. We are going to destroy this fucking town. So that is Richard, totally not a Nazi Spencer. Um, oh, wow. it's, it's so well yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, um, but it, it, it just, it cracks me the fuck up because, um, the, the whole point of the alt-right movement is to de nazify Nazism. Like, that, right. that's kind of how I see it. And yet they just can't help themselves when they're amongst themselves to be Nazis. He yelled <laughs> because they're so, Nazi. So he did this at a rally? Uh, it was, it was... Not a rally, but it was a group. Uh, it was like some kind of meetup for all the people that had gotten shunned after the murder murder okay. of Heather Heyer. So it was a meetup, um, so, and he addressed them. Yes, he addressed. So them. this is an address, right? So mm-hmm. like, obviously, he he was talking off the top of his head. Yes. Right. Yes. So, but jeez, oh, when when he says little fucking racial slur. I fucking, my ancestors fucking enslaved those little pieces of fucking shit. I Ugh. ruled the fucking world. He actually said this. Ugh. So, yeah. So, if it was news to anybody, it is, like, you know, if you were wondering, it is now very much confirmed that this dude is absolutely a fascist and absolutely a part of the National Socialist ideology. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I also uh... did... Just to bring it up, uh, do you ever um, do you ever read Rational Wiki? Um, I've 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 seen it. I don't like go there on purpose. Yeah. 
It's like it's a it's sort of like an atheist joke wiki, and it's it a tends joke wiki, really. It's okay. yeah, like they 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 make a lot of jokes. Um, okay, and like um, like for instance, Richard Spencer is under the category called frogs, clowns, and swastikas. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's like okay. it, it's a, it's sort of a joke website, uh, but it, it's skeptic oriented. It's left leaning. I wouldn't say it's leftist, but it's left leaning. Okay. But I did just want to read some of the some of the article written about Richard Spencer because this stuff is totally. <laughs> Hilarious. Well, first off, the picture of him is him giving the Nazi... Well, people giving him the Nazi salute at that rally he did in... Um, I think it was D.C. But anyway, Yeah, it was so somewhere around D.C., yeah. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the um, caption right underneath it, it says, Noted non-Nazi Richard Spencer getting some Roman salutes by other non-Nazis at a rally that didn't glorify Nazism because he's totally not a Nazi. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But I like the 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 thing the thing on the right that the, like the Wikipedia like list of information mm-hmm. that you can click on on the right. It has the right. rebuilding the Reich one member one meme at a time. Right, right. Oh my God. Well, and, and so so then uh, the, the the top part it says Richard Bertrand Spencer, uh, born nineteen seventy eight, is not a Nazi. He is simply identitarian, scratched out. Alt right scratched out in favor of white identity <laughs> politics. Yes, <laughs> he self identifies as an atheist. He is president of the National Policy Institute (NPI), a white nationalist think tank in Arlington, and of West Washington Summit Publishers uh, (WSP), a human biodiversity outlet, and Whitefish. Both institutes are supporters of identity politics for white Americans, which is not at all like Nazism. He says it over and over because he's not a Nazi, okay? He also hosts altright.com, which is totally not related to Nazis. <laughs> so, yeah, I love, I've read this thing so many times for my own humor, but I've never read it out loud. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, he also hosts altright.com, which is totally not related to Nazis, where Spencer is joined with fellow non-Nazis, including Brittany, uh, Brittany A. Pettibone. She's horrible if you don't know her. Um, yeah. Jared okay. Taylor and Lena L- Lactef. I actually. Oh no, Lana Lena Lactef. Lactef. She does. Yeah. Lana Lactef. She does uh, that red uh, ice. Um, whatever. Yeah, she's awful. She's awful. The, the other the um, other thing that's kind of funny about this page is a couple of sections down. It says everything's gonna be alt Reich, and there's a pull <laughs> quote at the top, which is of Spencer quoting Spencer for the white race. It's never over. Unquote. And then the, it says Richard Spencer, comma, who has ne- who has never ever whined about impending white genocide, which <laughs> right. it then has three um, footnote links. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the other best part on this is uh, the very last part. It's it's the, the headline is Welp with a well, period yes. and it's got the video of him giving the hail trump speech and it says the correct response to spencer and to the alt-right is in quotes wow that's some fucking cringy racialist meme non-nazi bullshit yeah oh my god <laughs> I don't know. what a mess oh god he's such a piece of shit man like um he he's in i, I don't know if he's finalized his divorce but um his divorce proceedings, and I, I do have questions about his wife because I know she's a she's a Russian who's done a lot of translation work for fascist text, okay. um, yeah, which is really weird and gross. But anyways, uh, it turns out that they're getting a divorce due to domestic violence, um, which oh, is wow. so shocking to oh. real, to think of somebody like Richard Spencer being being um, an abusive husband. Um, you know that it's it's not like. It's not like subjugating women is associated with fascism, is it? Oh, oh no. <laughs> no. No, well, right? Dude, I I had a real conversation with um with someone today, uh just just a friend um at work. And uh you know, I, I was telling her about uh about this Richard Spencer thing, um, because apparently that that's what I do when I talk to people that I work with. <laughs> oh my. I uh, but, um, you know, we were talking about fascism and about Nazi movements and how it's clearly uh, some kind of trauma or some kind of um, 
some kind of like mental health response to something much deeper or mental illness, uh, either in like, you know, narcissism or, or some, something in that sort of realm. Uh, because the thing, the thing that was pointed out was, was that all these fascists, they want to have this white ethno state, but then when they're actually like, like, it's not like they actually want equality for all white people because how do they treat women? Um, you know, how do they treat yeah. white women? How do they treat uh, any, but like, how do they treat short white people? That was something that I actually didn't really realize was that they consider height to be part of part of biology. That's a, that's an important thing to consider, which is fucking so stupid. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't know, man. Well, uh, so it's the if you if you really drink that Kool Aid whole hog mm-hmm. about biological superiority Mm -hmm. then the whole point of participating in in a society is to rank people from superior to inferior everyone Mm. has their rank right yeah so why so it's like how do you tell the difference between two white men Mm. i mean you can you can pick you know thousands of different ways right 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 so that's jeez wow are are you familiar well, with the oh go ahead sorry so so i i understand the interest of going to psychological um diagnosis as a way sure. to explain oh, and this. just just to actually explain I'm, obviously you're not work. doing anything medically yeah yeah of course I yeah yeah, yeah. Right. No, yeah no no no, no. Just, just just to explain where i was at work i was at my internship at mount sinai um doing my music therapy internship with another therapist so right. that just to give a little insight into why we were talking about it this way right exactly um, so but it's it's also the there's an important point i think it's i think it's dangerous to mm-hmm assume that member people that have far right ideologies to assume that they're mentally ill Mm -hmm. or that they have something or i mean there are i'm sure there are plenty of people who are having they have social problems Mm -hmm. and have psychological issues that are in that category Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. The issue is that there have been so many brilliant people who participate in these things for various other reasons. Sure, I mean, sure. It, it's so it, What's... it's it's so easy to assume that Hitler was mentally unstable. Mm-hmm. Rather well, uh, than just I, being I... Go ahead. Uh, I I actually just just to back up your point, um, I think of uh, even like Carl Schmitt uh, the philosopher, the Nazi philosopher, yeah. um, he was actually a very, very brilliant philosopher. He, he's, he's a monster. His ideas are horrible. Right. But yeah. he, he um, I, I'd say he's even more put together than Hitler ever was. Um, sure. Y- yeah. So. Well, no, just it's that, so it's the, what frightens me about sort of, making it so that people who disagree with us mm. are mm-hmm. somehow mentally inferior is doing is yes is doing what they do to us yeah yeah also so, i mean I'm, obviously you're not doing anything extreme yes, is what yes, they're talking yes. about it just it, it could very cl- easily become something like that and yeah. it also doesn't it also assumes that they don't really th- that given other cir- given other things they wouldn't think these things, mm-hmm. which because this ideology is so pervasive, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there's literally there there are things about it that are doing such good work for them that that they want to believe these things, right? And it's like how do you like. It's the I mean because obviously Dorian you've thought a lot about all of these things because it's like how <laughs> yes. do how do you how do you fight this right yes and how do you fight it so that you're not necessarily blaming the person who thinks it because you don't know how they came upon these ideas mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But how, but and it's impossible to really draw a line between the people who have been sort of sucked into this and if they got other information, they would think something else. And the people that no matter what you talk to them about, they're going to stand there and, and think that white racial superiority is the end all and be all of historical um, logic. And you can't change their mind because there's hundreds of years of evidence in their mind. Bullshit evidence, of course. But right. they're going to think those things. Right? So how do you like because I don't I don't imagine like Dorian, if you had access to some particular group of like uh, like a, someone you knew who was some crazy right wing person and you could and you could identify ways of interacting with them that might slowly change them over time into being a, mm-hmm. um, a socially acceptable human rather than. You know, but you wouldn't apply the same thing to Richard Spencer. You might try once or twice, but fail. Mm-hmm. And it's like, because in a way, in the end, you have to fight Richard Spencer. Yeah, when it when it comes down to it, it it, it is actual conflict between right. the two ideologies. Well, you know, this um, is the thing that's you know, this is the thing that's scary about some kind of left wing ideologies, mm-hmm, which is mm-hmm. you know, obviously, I am. I'm so close to being pacifist that there, I don't know if there's an ex, a, a distinction. Sure. But, but pacifism can be, if not well considered, you can end up in a decision where the person you're having to fight is Richard Spencer and you lose. Yes. Right? I mean, that's that's part, that's one of the possible outcomes of Gandhian non-aggression that's actually one of the major reasons gandhi was assassinated um i was talking to a friend of mine uh from india who um i don't i don't really know how to identify his politics in any way that would quite make sense to an american audience because i don't even understand it um a hundred percent but he was telling me how gandhi is actually quite a divisive character um historical figure in india Right. Because uh, uh, the people that don't like Gandhi see him as somebody who almost sold the Indian people out. Um, yeah, wow. Because and, well, and also really made international headway, but didn't um, and, and it, uh, d- didn't do enough to actually uh, affect the people who are being directly directly oppressed by by the English. Um, right. Well, it's because well, in the end, what is the result of Gandhi's mm-hmm. revolution? Uh-huh. His family has come to power in an extremely corrupt Indian. I guess mm-hmm. it's a democracy. I mean, like, well, I mean, they call themselves a democracy, but I mean, it's so corrupt. Oh yeah. That I mean, like, the name Gandhi in India is itself kind of a joke to the people who've never seen any change in their life, exactly. even before, since before Gandhi. So it's yeah. exact. Well, it's like well, here's the deal. It's like if you have a good pacifist leader, you can make a certain amount of headway in society, but they're almost guaranteed to be assassinated because there's always someone willing to stand up and shoot somebody like that. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I I, I always think about um, just this happens a lot when I talk and talk to some of my liberal friends where they get they they blame third party voters as being the worst possible people <laughs> in, in the American electoral system. They're wrong. And, yeah, well, of course they're wrong. And and <laughs> I always bring up, it's like, you know, I've got a friend who's from inner city Cleveland. And he's an African-American guy, and he voted for Jill Stein in a swing state. And when I asked him why he didn't vote for Hillary Clinton, he said, you think, like, she would change anything in my neighborhood? He's like, I'm voting for, like, the person who gives the most fuck about my neighborhood. And right. he's like, he's like, he's like, y'all have been living, like, we've been living under Trump for, for centuries. Like, exactly. you're just experiencing it now. And, right. and I, I mean, I actually find um, the whole white privilege thing uh, to be completely blatant in, in that exact argument where it's, right. it's like all third party people are horrible. And it's like, it's like, well, except you're not putting yourself in the shoes of the third party voters. Um, right. and, and, and no one is a monolith that I don't know. Right. I, I'm yeah, exactly. So it's, it's just like, this is of course, not to confuse the issue of whether or not third party specific third part, uh, small political parties or their candidates 
mm-hmm. are lacking in, uh, don't have their own problems and, con- and um, oh, significant yeah. issues that they have to deal with. I mean, hell, I've been oh, a, yeah. I've been a Green Party politician. I know what the fuck is wrong with the Green Party. Let me tell you what. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. So, but that's because but but I also understand that it's a bunch of people volunteering who have no money. I mean, so it's or if they do yes. have money, they're spending it on their own campaign to be able to even just put out mm-hmm. ideas that the Democrats will refuse to talk about for 10 years. So, it's <clears throat> So, you know, you're right in that you're going to end up in a situation where you have if if you don't take the I, I the reason I interrupted a while back was basically oh sure we have it's, the 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 un, the underlying point is you have to take your adversaries' ideas and whatever their ideology that is implied by them very seriously, mm-hmm. irrespective of their of their mental state, because in the end. We have no way to really judge about how effective they will be with their message beyond yes. the fact that they're still there and they're saying things we've all heard before, yet for some fucking reason, they keep talking. So uh, to clarify, I guess, my point in this is the right. danger with any of the sciences is people will take snippets of them and run with it in a completely wrong direction like i always think of uh what's his name the guy who um the guy who's in prison right now he was uh the ceo of enron i can't think of his name oh i think kenneth Um, lay yeah yeah that's him so you know he was a huge um richard dawkins and charles darwin fan oh really He, he read their books um on biology and that that in his mind justified everything he did with enron oh, and geez. yeah and and you know oh my God, people mind, like, still follow social darwinism after all this time well of course we're dude, talking about all right people of course yeah never yeah. mind <laughs> like yeah. yeah right yeah well i'm, I'm not jesus christ really that's awful well, and, and i i mean dude he uh uh kenneth lay his one of his favorite books was *The Selfish Gene* by Richard Dawkins, oh, Jesus. which has nothing. That's not to... what it's about. I <laughs> know, and Richard Dawkins even like, like was like, "What? How did you get that message from my book about about um, memetics and and how the slow evolutionary process, uh, you know, goes goes on for hundreds and hundreds of generations before it becomes a new species." Well, and it's the same thing with uh, Charles Darwin's survival of the fittest. People misinterpret that uh, as you have to be this, like, fit, strong, aggressive, uh, like, like you know, authoritarian leader, which right. that that's not at all what, it, what is it being talked about in The Origin of Species. Uh, well, so, so anyways, um, just to get a little in... Uh, explain i guess where where i'm coming from when i when i said the earlier comment was right um just with my digging into um neo-nazi and fascist like culture and that world just to kind of see what's going on um so i'm convinced uh convinced with some evidence and am very uh, I, basically a lot of this is hypothesis. And um, if I ever do a master's degree, this will probably be what my thesis is going to be on. Okay. Um, is looking at extremist reactionary politics and seeing where these views came from. Because my mm. hypothesis is that a lot of them form from a form of trauma, uh, undiagnosed mm. trauma. The reason is, um, you know, just look at Richard Spencer. He's he's a uh, he's abusive to his to his wife. Uh, you know that he he's a physical abuser. What we know about physical abusers is they were physically abused. Not a hundred percent, but I'd say ninety seven percent, ninety eight percent. So. Sure. There is abuse somewhere in Richard Spencer's history, and I'm not even right, saying right. it's coming from his parents, because that's not always the case. Another right. example is Frank Mienk, who was, uh, who was a neo-Nazi who left the movement 
um, and is now a very, very strong ally and activist on, on our side. Uh, um, but he talks about how he was being bullied, uh, like life-threateningly bullied, uh, mm-hmm. on a daily basis when he was living in Philadelphia um, by kids in his school. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, he, he couldn't get home without getting the shit kicked out of him. Um, and that's what led him towards, uh, towards Nazism. Um, so, so the hypothesis is that, well, and, and this is where it is interesting mixing, mixing the psychologist self and the activist self. Um, so I, I, I always put this like out there. It's like, if it comes down to it and we actually have to take sides, like I already know the side I'm taking, um, and I, sure. I think, you know, it's like I already know that. However, yeah. um, in a preventative method, like like I'm all about like couples therapy, like, you know, couples should be doing couples therapy before there's a problem that needs that needs therapy because sure. you're building tools um, and mental health in. I mean, not just this like American culture, but just in the world culture is not taken very seriously. No. Um I mean, you know, look at look at the homeless veteran rate and the suicide rate of of U.S. military veterans. Um, and a- actually, just on, on a quick side note, um, I was literally talking to a maintenance guy today uh, who, um, uh, you know, we were just talking about the military, and he was like, you know, I I don't know about all this PTSD stuff that they talk about because you know my 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 dad was in World War II. He was an older maintenance guy, a really cool uh, guy to talk to. But he was like, you know, my dad was in World War II, and he didn't seem to have any of that. Uh, number one, it's like, I bet he did have some of it, and you yeah. just took you took certain parts of his behavior as not being traumatic. Like, I didn't, you know, I didn't dig into this guy. It's like, hey, how is your dad's temper? Hey, how, you know, like, hey, did your dad ever get really paranoid? Um, but anyways, to go right. a step further is the technology is different now. So things that would have killed you in World War II, people are now living through oh, because Jesus. the technology is better. So yeah. in, in, in World War II, a grenade goes off, you die. In the Iraq War, you have a, uh, an IED go off and your Humvee flips over, you, you survive. But you just survived a, a, you know, an IED explosion. <laughs> Um, that is going to, that, so, so the thing is, is part of the reason we're seeing more PTSD is we're more aware of it, but part of it is that, uh, is that the technology is more, is making people more survivable. Um, so, so back to, back to the Nazis, um, (laughs) (laughs) my poor wife, dude, my poor wife, uh, she has to live with this stuff, but, um, but, uh, anyways, it has been pretty consistent. Um, any former fascist I've ever spoken to, and any former jihadist I've spoken to, when they because a lot of these people have left these extremist movements, they realize how they got there. They they mm-hmm. have an ex you know like um, there's a couple of uh, of jihadists that were all I don't know if they were associated with ISIS or Al Qaeda. But they were all Arabic men that had um, div- uh, gotten refugee status uh, during the Gulf War in England, yeah. and um, mm-hmm. and were constantly racially profiled. And yeah. and the thing is, racial profiling creates trauma. And 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 I mean, you can look at it societally, or you can look at it individually. Look at the trauma that takes place in the inner city of you know with people of color. Uh, just just with exploitation from police and the criminal justice system and and, and the thing is trauma passes on generationally yes. um and so 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 all of this to say is my hypothesis is that if it comes well sir my activist side is if it comes down to it i know which side i am going to be on but in a preemptive way i'm very very curious and i'm very convinced that if we could address mental health issues in a very holistic way, we might be able to eradicate uh, some of these some of these extremist ideologies. In a, okay. In well, a, well, 
Yeah. So and, with, and that's, with that explanation, I, I, I think you're right yeah. about that. And keep in mind, I'm looking at it as a scientific lens because this is still a hypothesis. I have never right. done a study. This is straight up just shooting the shit with people. Like, well, so Dorian, it's the, you know, so the, the, you know, some of all the, yeah. like, I, I didn't know a good number of those stats, but I know a fair number of those things that you were mm-hmm. listing. And it's like the idea that the, the whole idea that trauma is passed on generationally mm-hmm. and that uh, there, there are so many different kinds of ways we can have trauma. I mean, and the fact that or mm-hmm. that we've had a name for PTSD uh, going back to the First World War at least. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the, the idea, like shell shock. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's this, so it's the, the idea that the, peop, the, the men who came back from the First and the Second World, the First World War, were so uh, just had no, no way to express mm-hmm. what happened to them. Yes. And... Of course, that changed how they interacted with their families and their children. Mm-hmm. And then their children went to World War II, which was worse. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and those, the children of those people are our parents. Yes. So it's not that long ago that these things were happening. Mm-hmm. So it's the, the, and I, you know, I know for a fact that, you know, the ways in which my grandfather, my mother's father treated yeah. his family was completely related to being a mess sergeant who, who got into the military when he was 16 by lying. Mm. And then he, and he was in, he was in Korea and in Vietnam. I think he did two tours of Vietnam. Wow. I mean, so, um, or was it, he did two tours or something, but he was, he did that for like 20 some years and he treated, my mother hated him. Wow. She talked my grandmother into divorcing him. Wow. And somehow, I don't know how this happened. I mean, because there's similar trauma on my father's side. Sure. That somehow my parents somehow figured out a way to go get help with learning learning how to raise children, mm-hmm. and like purposely trying to do it differently than they were raised, yep. so that the generational trauma didn't pass as badly onto me and my siblings. <laughs> yes, I mean, well, so and, it's like it's yeah, 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 of course. So it means so anecdotally in my own life, mixed with this and me knowing some of those stats, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that you're more likely to find information to that you're more likely to find that um, that kind of stuff happening in that space. Now the question is scientifically is if it's is it more prevalent in that space than in another space? Right, right. And I mean, well, and that's that's where it gets into the real complicating factors, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's so yeah. I was, I, I'm anyway. sorry, I keep cutting you off, man. I know you're in the middle of like a thought, but there's just there's a couple of things just I wanted to just kind of pop in. Go um, is uh, so the 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 uh, looking at it on a macro level, you know, with historical figures. Look at the history of Mussolini and Hitler. Mm-hmm. They were both uh, relatively socially aware people. Like Mussolini was a staunch socialist, uh, you know, at one point in his life. Um, Hitler, I'm not quite sure about his political views pre World War One, um, mm-hmm. but they both uh, they, they both were considered war heroes. They yeah. both had a drastic change on we need to fix our society. They both did a political act that led them to prison, and they both honed their skills in prison. So the thing is, I'm not saying all war heroes who try to get politically active and try to change their culture will become a fascist dictator. But Um, for uh, For example, John McCain didn't do that. No, no, he did not. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. 
<laughs> but it should be considered that two of the most intense fascist dictators of the 20th century had similar timelines. That needs to be considered. Right. The well, second... you know, it's the... Oh, right, yeah. Of course, it's the it's the it's the fact that some like. The, the prevalence of psychopathy in, mm-hmm. like, high-level boardroom places yeah. is way out of proportion to anywhere else in society. Mm-hmm. And that needs to be considered when you wonder why uh, corporate America is so fucked up. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. so then uh, the second factor, and this is, this is actually a beautiful thing for this podcast, because... Uh, not only one of my favorite uh, writers on um, cognitive psychology, but also one of my favorite political writers, Noam Chomsky. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> Chomsky actually talks about how young the field of psychology is. Uh, oh, yeah. And he, he brings up how, you know, we, like astronomy, we understood astronomy um, way before Galileo, but shit changed after Galileo. And in the field right. of psychology, we haven't had our Galileo yet. Like, oh. we know all this stuff's out there, but we haven't had that, like, oh, no shit, we're the se- like, we're not the center of the planet. Everything's a sphere. Holy fuck. Like, <laughs> you know, we haven't had that moment yet um, yeah, where, where astronomy has. You know, because, I mean, dude, look at Freud and Jung. You know, they're both incredibly important for the, the development of psychoanalysis, However, most of their theoretical shit is bullshit. Like oh, now, yeah, it's garbage. Garbage. <laughs> it's right. Complete garbage. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't change their importance to the field. You know, I still use Jungian techniques when working with patients, um, and I still, you know, Freud's concept of the unconscious and concept of talk therapy was a revolutionary thing. He also thought right. that cocaine would cure it would cure anxiety. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> that that wasn't God. right. Um, so no. I, I didn't mean I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just wanted no. to get those two points in. Right. Um, well, it's a, it's no. I, in the end, Duran, the 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 reason this has gone on for thirty seven minutes or whatever <laughs> is that. Well, it's just you know it's it's interesting how when you just dis, when you're discussing something in a in a scientific mode, mm-hmm. how that can be warped in the larger society. Oh, yeah. By either inadvertent or purposeful misunderstanding of scientific ideas. Right? Yes. And this is what this is all ends up being about, right? I mean, the people on the right malform perfectly acceptable scientific ideas for the time in which they're created mm-hmm. in an effort to turn the society they have into the ghoulish thing we have or mm-hmm. something worse, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it's eugenics helps turn this you know helps create the holocaust you know right. so it's or or it allows people to um purposefully um uh take poor generally women of color in the south even mm-hmm. into like living some of these people are still alive and to say you're too stupid to have babies so they have the state um you know, uh, remove their ability, you know, to, I, why is the word not coming to me? They neuter them, basically. And it's just like, you gotta yep. be fucking, they, they, the, what is it? Chemical castration, that's the word. Yeah. So it's like, so this is something that even happens, it's like, it happens in this country to people who are still alive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, and like, every once in a while, there's news stories about, how the some government is having to, like local government is having to pay off uh, pay pay some settlement for that horrible things they did and these are done by people who called themselves progressive mhm right i mean like that was one of the major things about the the you know where this is the thing that happens in the 20 this 2020 election season that we're endlessly living through hey guess yeah. what beto's not in anymore <laughs> oh. Anyway, <laughs> but anyway, but this uh, like who cares? Firm policy Six positions. months too late, you know. Um, but the the progressive, the the original progressives from the early twentieth century, mm-hmm. I mean, they held some extremely reprehensible views about ways yeah. to better their society through science. Mm-hmm. So it just oh, makes yeah. me wonder about which ones that we have. Oh yeah, 
Oh yeah, I'm sure we could identify them if we thought for a bit. But yeah. oh, I think it. I think it's the. I think it's the uh, the twenty three and me kind of stuff. Okay. I think that's the thing that's gonna be. That could it could could fend in that direction, right? It's this idea that you can plug in your genes, mm-hmm. you can get people to analyze them, and we've got now we'll have all of these uh, corporate these corporations have literally quadrillions of data, whatever it's a made up number of, of the the genomic uh, genomes of everybody, right? The 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 DNA of so many people. That then they can use all of that data to determine who gets better health, you know, who has to pay more for their health coverage, mm-hmm. right? Or I mean, even and even things way more insidious than that, right? And I'm just thinking about like the way they can make money. Yeah. But it's the it's the it's the it's the Kenneth Lays who will come up with the way to make money that's actually going to harm people, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, oh man, it just it just oh. well it's. it's just imagine, like, that's the thing that I find interesting is, like, everybody treats it like this, this, um, it's like, ooh, well, I get to find out where my ancestry is from. And then what happened to Elizabeth Warren last year? Oh, yeah. You know, she's been telling this story about how her grand, grand, granny told her that, you know, they had Cherokee, or her mother told her they had Cherokee blood somewhere. Mm-hmm. And it never occurred to anybody in the campaign to go, hey, uh, maybe we should check with the Cherokee Nation to just figure out if us doing this is okay. Yeah, yeah. Right, and it's just because you know that's because this is the thing that I always keep in mind about you know certain ways in which scientific thinking kind of um, can go off in ways that don't make sense if you don't consider if as, as soon as you consider another point of view you kind of go like well why are we making those decisions like mm-hmm. you know it's mm-hmm. as if it's in the water right so right. i've done an, i've done a little bit of reading into the what's called the great bearing like the great bearing strait sort of land bridge hypothesis mm-hmm. theory that you know that the that there were not hum- like so the thing I brought up earlier. If well, actually, was that before we started? Well, it doesn't matter. But that if human beings all have the same genetic line going back to whatever it is in North Africa, that means that the people who are who we refer to as natives or First Nations peoples in North America, in the Americas, that they also come from there too, and. So how did they get here? Well, if you actually go look up what Native American tribal people think about that scientific theory, you'll learn that they think that that's made up and bullshit. And right. they don't consider things that the Native people do when they're coming up with these, what they're quote unquote scientific ideas, right? Oh yeah. So so there are, apparently there are options whereby that they had boat that it's possible that they could have had boats to get from the oceanic Oceania the those kind of small islands um what oh whatever direction it is east of Australia and stuff. Mm. Yeah, that yeah, the yeah, genetic yeah. markers of people in those islands are very similar to South American people. Oh wow. So it's possible that they could have made boats. Yeah. And if they could have made boats, then you don't need a land bridge. So I thought this would be a good time to actually bring some music uh, conversation sure. into this. Anyway, uh, but it actually from, fits ahead. everything we're just talking about. Are you familiar with the bass player and composer Nick Dunstan? No, I'm not. Oh, dude. Check him out like right now. I put some stuff in the show notes. Um uh, Tenth Intervention, we're actually working on producing um, a performance of one of his pieces called La, La Operacion, um, and it's a du- double saxophone trio and soprano voice. And um, uh, it's uh, it's um, two drum sets, two ba- double basses, Nick being one of them, and two saxophones, and then uh, uh, a, a soprano. And so um, Nick is, I believe his... Uh, Nick, if you're listening to this, I'm sorry if I get it wrong, man. Um, it's I think his father is African American and his mom is Puerto Rican, um, but uh, it, it, it's 
Uh, he, he's half African American and half Puerto Rican. Um, he's okay. also a fucking incredible bass player. Um, and cool. he's very cool because he's a, he's a jazz kind of guy, but he's also very much into the avant-garde um, sort of free jazz stuff. And um, actually, just so, you, just so all you know, when 10th Intervention produces it, we're using Lathan Hardy and Michael Eaton as the saxophones. Um, and very then nice. I think we're going to get Evan Runyon and Nick Dunstan, and my wife is giving me the don't talk about this on the podcast. So, sorry, but it's it's already out there. No one's going to listen to this. I think we're good. But uh, anyways, uh, La Operacion, it's a piece. Um, I'm just going to read uh, the first paragraph of the Wikipedia article about the documentary that uh, Nick's piece is based on. So, and you're going to vomit, David. Um, La Operacion is a 40-minute documentary film by Ana Maria Garcia about U.S.-imposed sterilization policies in Puerto Rico, produced by Latin, the Latin America and Film Project and released in 1982. This film explores the mass sterilization of Puerto Rican women during the 1950s and 1960s. In the documentary, Garcia sheds light on the decades-long practice of conducting interviews with women of different ethnic and economic backgrounds who have undergone the sterilization procedure. In addition to these interviews, Garcia provides historical information regarding the conditions that led to the sterilization practice. Historical background. Beginning with the Spanish-American War of 1898, the film details the origin and subsequent expansion of U.S. involvement in Puerto Rico. Citing that the island was overpopulated, the United States implemented many strategies to try and remedy the perceived problem, all of which are showcased in the documentary. The promoting my... From promoting migration to large cities and mainland to family planning, numerous methods were tested. One of the most controversial methods was the idea of forced sterilization. As depicted in the film, this process would provide two perceived benefits to Puerto Rican society. First and foremost, the procedure would drastically reduce the number of children being born on the island, thus reducing the overall population problem. Also, This would allow more women to be members of the labor force, which would be required by the American companies that were taking a foothold in Puerto Rico. The film discusses the whole concept by showcasing Operation Bootstrap, the idea of transforming the economy on the island to a more developed one. Interviews. The interviews conducted in this film are with women who have undergone the sterilization procedure. They recount their personal experiences as well as those of their family members. In some cases, even some of the women's female children have been subjected to the procedure. They reflect on how the procedure has affected their lives and express their overall feelings towards it. Some of the women regret the procedures while others are confused as to what exactly happened to them. The film also features physicians and experts on this topic topic, who give their respective opinions on this subject. The thing that, and I I have not watched the documentary yet, um, but we we talked extensively with Nick about this. Um, A lot of the women were tricked into the sterilization procedure. They were given misleading information. And, Mm -hmm. and, I mean, dude, this is is 1950s and 60s, uh, like, post-Holocaust eugenics program. Imposed yeah. by the U.S. the U.S. government on brown. Well, you know, people. well, it's you know, it's well, they're brown people. They're different. Yeah, it's it's. Well, it's, obviously that's not true, everybody. But yes. Yeah, it's anyway. fucking disgusting, God. man. Well, um, of course it is. So it's yeah, the, yeah. that's it's that kind of shit, right? So it's mm-hmm. the. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, what sorry is, to throw that one on you, man. Just process yeah, all of this. Just, like, <laughs> what is? It just goes to show you that you know any kind of ideology can make you do terrible things if you're not careful. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, oh well, we know we can solve the st- we can solve the problem by taking all these poor women and sterilizing them. And I'm like, yeah, you you, what what ideals do you hold, you piece of garbage? Jeez, I know, <sighs> dude. I was. Oh. A- Actually, uh, I just listened to a Murray Bookchin speech um, a couple days ago, uh, mm-hmm. and 
Uh, I, what what do you think of Murray Bookchin? Just curious. Uh, oh, I haven't really read it. any of his stuff. I haven't had time. I mean, there's just yeah. So <laughs> um, he. Uh, I'm trying to find the the link. Uh, I'll, I'll. Oh, yep, popped up. Murray Bookchin, uh, Nature and Ideology. He um, talks about overpopulation and how the right gets it horribly wrong. Um, he said, he's like, yes, there is an overpopulation problem happening with, uh, with humankind versus the other animals. Um, and this, uh, he's like, this, the fascists get right. They see overpopulation as a problem. However, eugenics is not the way at all. And basically he gets into, um, into quality of life arguments, how, uh, one of the reasons that um, economic, uh, ep- economically disenfranchised uh, are, are participating in overpopulation is because they actually have nothing to do with themselves. The, the thing that, um, and I, I actually just realized I don't really want to talk about this on here because I'm not quite familiar. I only listened to the speech once and I agreed mm-hmm. with what Murray said, but I realized that I could totally, totally misconstrue his message. Um, sure. And I don't want to okay. do that. And this is That's how you fine. do a responsible speech, people. Uh, <laughs> if you don't know about <laughs> if you don't know about something, make sure you learn it before you talk about it. There um, you go. All right. Well. <laughs> yeah, because I don't want to misconstrue. Last... Yeah. <laughs> what do you want to do in the last ten minutes then? Oh man. Um. Well. Uh. So you took the GRE today. I know, I did. So, so <laughs> just in case anybody doesn't know what the goddamn GRE is, what is it, the Graduate Records Examination or something like that? Okay. It's just some bullshit test like the SAT that they make people who are going into, who want, who are trying to get some sort of uh, doctorate or something or some sort of grad school to take. And it is as, it is a, it is a load of horseshit. This whole thing is just horseshit. Wow. So it's a standardized test, and it tested me on two general, well, three generalized things. There is a writing section where you have to write, you have to write a, an issues essay. They give you a prompt, and you have to decide, say if you agree with it or not. Then they yeah. give you somebody's half baked argument, and they say, "Tell us why this is not a good argument, and how can you make it better?" Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> and then, then, then there is the verbal section, which is literally like. If you were Antonin Scalia and you were deciding that uh, you wanted to uh, split every fucking goddamn hair for two hours, that's what taking the verbal reasoning section of the GRE is. Oh. And, and uh, the other half is called quantitative reasoning, which is doing math I haven't done in 15 years. <laughs> Actually, it's closer to 20. Okay, okay. So So it's literally like... Here's a triangle. One side is two. The other side is three. How long is the hypotenuse? And if it's a right triangle, which luckily you get some of those things, you can know that the hypotenuse, oh fuck, I'm screwing it up. It's three and four, and then the <laughs> hypotenuse would be five. Wow. And I'm just, and Dorian, I haven't done math since I was in fucking high school. Oh yeah, and holy shit! I just like I haven't having to relearn all those goddamn formulas and reminding myself with a stain. Like this is all wonderful information. It's like there's nothing wrong with abstract mathematics, and oh, you can no. apply a lot of it to regular life. I mean, there were literally been questions on um, as I've been practicing for a week that are literally like basically like the kind of problems I would find myself in with a grade book and having to do weighted grading of the final grade in in, mm, mm. in, in, a, in a spreadsheet. I mean, it's like, so it's like some of it ends up being useful, but mm-hmm. it's just like, it's sitting here going, so I'm going to go get a humanities PhD and you want to know if I remember the Pythagorean theorem? <laughs> wow. Because, you know, the, and, and, the, and the, the writing, so Dorian, the writing question, so I'll, I'll connect it with music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there. So if you ever decide to take the GRE, the current online preview, if you sign up the GRE online, and then you, you can do a, free, a couple of free practice tests. And before the free mm. practice test, there's something called PARPAP Online. Mm. And the first 
uh, reading comprehension question is based on, uh, it just gives you an example of the test. It's not a full length practice test. Mm -hmm. Is about Philip Glass. Okay. And so you read about Philip Glass and the reading, the little three paragraphs is about how Philip Glass uh, is writing uh, sophisticated music for rock, people who like rock music rather than writing classical music that's taking advantage of popular music techniques or whatever. It was a strange mm. little thing. But anyway, so what's amazing about the GRE is everything's based completely on your ability to analyze any particular set of paragraphs that are put in front of you, whether or not you know anything about them. Mm -hmm. So it meant that me being one of the few hundred people in the United States who know Philip Glass music well enough and have read enough about Philip Glass and read Philip Glass's own writings that um, knowing all that information may be worse at answering the questions. <laughs> because the questions are about the reading. And guess what? That reading about Philip Glass wasn't mm -hmm. really right about Philip Glass. I mean, like, mm. I know enough about Philip Glass that I know it's wrong, but mm -hmm. that doesn't matter. Your job is to analyze the stuff that's in the two paragraphs in front of you. Mm -hmm. And oh my God, I was about ready to choke someone when I did that. Because I'm getting things wrong about Philip Glass. And I'm like, no, I know this. <laughs> like, this is this is my specialty, you shits. Right. And it's just like, so the other was the, so uh, other stuff like this is, so <laughs> there are issue essay prompts. And in one of the books I was reading, the one of the examples is, so here's an issue. The issue they give you, and you're supposed to write a response mm -hmm. is music education is one of the is a subject that is um it's controversial in certain ways because as funding for public schools goes down they're deciding to try to deciding to cut back on quote fringe education fringe subjects from the from public schools and one of those things is music education so Obviously, and so it's like, well, do you agree or disagree with this idea? Blah, 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 right? And they give you a sample essay that is apparently can is is an example that gets the highest score. Okay. On the the test, so obviously, so obviously the 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 essay refers to music education, like saying that music education is important and that we should uh, protect it. Okay. It's like, okay, that's fine and all, but the essay is well organized it's well written but it's wrong <laughs> it's wrong like it says it gives examples of how music education is helpful to other music to 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 other subjects and is useful in education because it helps with hand hand eye coordination it helps it helps oh with God. your coordination it it there's brain science that shows that it connects to logic centers or whatever and the, the my favorite part was the one where it said that what was the fuck it said it said that um the essay said that uh oh so the uh it said that because mu because the uh, the education the people oh you don't notice it was this it was that stu there are studies that show that children who are taught music learn music as children that they are better at vo have a larger vocabulary mm. and are better at all these other school things. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, I've heard about those studies. I'm pretty sure that those studies correlate music learning younger with better school performance because the people who can afford music lessons are rich people who then have time or have people to read to their children when they're little. That has nothing to do with music. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and then... The, yeah, I'll keep going, keep going, man. So there's one more, which is that... Yeah. Then it makes the point that as as the number of students that are in the... Um, in the... Uh, that as the student body of the United States diversifies, and we're going to have more people immigrating here from other places who don't speak English... It's better to have things uh, things for students to do that don't involve language. And so music 
in school is a great way for them to do something that isn't language oriented. And I was sitting there going, I've been studying music my whole life. I can't imagine doing it without language. How do you teach music without language? I mean, I'm just like, dude, no. I mean, it's like, I mean, like math is a, is another thing that doesn't require language to teach it. Except that, of course, it does. I mean, it's just like, I mean, you would never say that about mathematics. But yeah. because music is pretty, you think the same thing. Yeah, you well, think that you think this other thing. I mean, it just, yeah. it drove me crazy reading it. It was just like, this is a six because it's organized lovely and they make up shit? That's what this is? I mean, yeah, there's no verification involved with the, you wrote a, you wrote a beautifully, a beautiful essay that's wrong. <laughs> it's like uh anyway uh, well and now and now so, you're prepared for your academic life to get your your doctorate in music composition oh because of that test well, dude just to bring it fucking back to politics be in like theory but yeah what yeah. a fucking capitalistic way of looking at music it's like you oh, see know, right. this thing that is actually a really really important human phenomenon that's existed since we developed fire will make you more successful at practical skills for money making. <laughs> yeah, music isn't in, isn't in and of itself an inherent good. Right. Which is yeah. just yeah, it's it's so cap like that's the thing I couldn't stand about a lot of the essays is they oh, were yeah. so fucking capitalist. Oh my god. It just dude. What, so, so Dorian, I I I had to do all this shit just to make sh- just to figure out a way to make sure that I could like actually do decent on the test. Mm-hmm. And it just drove me crazy. I mean, it's just it's a whole fuck. The whole thing is a fucking scam, dude. And I had to pay two hundred plus dollars just to, just to, just for them to experiment on me by adding me to their pool of people who've taken the test. And the God. thing is, all these programs that I'm applying to in music theory are, you know, they they require it, but they're generally not going to give a damn how I did on it. Oh yeah, dude. It's just like um, thinking this through, uh, it. This is one of my major problems with a lot of this information. Like, did did they actually cite any of these studies? Uh, no, well, you don't. You don't have any time to do anything like that. Well, it's something well, you write well, in thirty. It's something you write in thirty minutes. Yeah. Well, I, like I, I mean, I'm just saying that I've read articles like this, where then you go and you read the scientific data, and it's like they yeah. fucking got it wrong. Like, yeah, they do that all the ag- time. Yeah. Yeah, they're pushing an agenda. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't know, man, it's, the yeah, part... there are a lot of scientific articles yeah. about how, like, music tonality is like a, is like an inherent aspect of musical organization, and yeah. you, then you real, then you go in and you real, like, these are done by computer scientists, mm-hmm. who are, don't really have real any kind of theoretic, music theoretical training that's deeper than what you would get in an undergraduate curriculum, and then you know why, because when you go read how they determined what was quote-unquote tonal, mm-hmm. it's just, it just, it's so biased, you can't even take what their, their results seriously. Right. And well, I'm yeah. a person who actually thinks that there's some, there is some bio, there is some, something going on with the way music organization happens that's related to the way that where our bo- our brains and bodies are func- are inherently exist yeah but i would never make a claim like saying that quote unquote tonality or whatever it is our music actually does is somehow inherently the only way to do something i mean just like that's just like whoa i'm not gonna do that yeah it's it's like it's like so what are your views on just intonation or indian music yeah (laughs) yeah yeah, exactly it's just this whole it's you realize how 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 full of shit this can be if you just don't go and read the stuff yourself. Mm-hmm, and it's mm-hmm. oh my god. Yeah. Anyway, dude, so that that was that was my that was my frustrating two weeks is oh, just going crazy so about the frustrating. GRE. So frustrating. Yeah. Dude, it's all right. So this is this is like a therapeutic like analysis. Just just you know keep keep in mind, y'all. I'm a novice. I'm an intern, so I might recant everything i say right now in a so, year well, here we go say that yeah. this is not medical advice yes this is not medical advice uh but um you know so there there is some truth to music is good for nonverbal. that's one that's one thing like you know with alzheimer's uh you can communicate with people who are severely uh 
affected by Alzheimer's disorder um, or yes. Alzheimer's disease with music, but it gets a little deeper than just than just oh you play music and then they smile. It's no when people have Alzheimer's in their right hemisphere, they don't lose their verbal skills so there's different things that are needed to to be addressed um but the alzheimer's most people are aware of is the alzheimer's that affects the left hemisphere which is where Mm. your language comes from and so music is a way to communicate to the right hemisphere of the brain and get the person to engage with you and engage with the world around them because they are often still conscious they're just trapped in a fuzz. That's why the disease is horrible. Because right. they know they're stuck. Like, they know this. And that's one reason music is very good for nonverbal. Another example of music is uh, nonverbal. I currently am working in a psychiatric uh, unit um, as one of my jobs. And without specific details, I have definitely done some really hip-ass drum circles with schizophrenic and bipolar people who are checked in and and it is a good thing because you can actually have an entire crew like hanging out with you communicating with one another non-verbally however what happens after the drum circle is all these people who have serious mental issues who are checked into a long-term hospital, start talking to each other after the drum circle. (laughs) It's so much more than just, see, they communicated. It's, it's, it's that it, it makes the human experience so much more meaningful and so much more important. And, you know, like, I don't know, man, like one of the things that I've learned from working with schizophrenic people, we have sort of the Hollywood ideation of what a schizophrenic person is like. You meet real mm-hmm. schizophrenic people, they're mostly normal in the way they function and interact. They just have a completely different perception of the world. Um, mm. And one thing that was actually brought up by one of my, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Michael Viega, who's a really incredible uh, music therapist. Who His specialty, by the way, is hip-hop music therapy, and I'd love to have him on here to talk about that. Because he's fucking Sweet. brilliant in that shit. Uh, but but anyway, um, also just one quick side note: one of the social workers, one of the reasons he's such a big deal in the music therapy world, is there were social workers that would come and see him doing music therapy sessions, and the social workers would be like, "How did you get two opposing gangs in the same room singing songs together?" And, and Dr. Viega is <laughs> like, motherfucking Dr. Dre, man. <laughs> like, you, know, yeah. you know, so so there there is some some truth to all these like fanciful blah, blah, blahs. But anyways, um, uh, what the fuck was I saying? Why did I bring up Viega? Uh, shit, I something lost it. Something to dude. do with um, something to do with the fact that. Uh, yeah, I don't know either. Yeah, it was uh, communication, schizophrenic people. Uh, right. Oh no, fuck! I lost it. If, if it comes, okay. yeah, it, it it it'll come back next it, week. <laughs> yeah, it won't. It won't come back in the next minute or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the yeah, it, it, in the end, or it, it's that, is that, it shows you that even in a bullshit essay, mm-hmm. in a practice workbook about a fucking standardized test that the complexity of music gets boiled down to how does it help our students get better grades in their math or their English class right which is just insulting to the that how how important music or anything else that enriches human life yeah is yeah when it gets boiled down the capitalist garbage. Yeah. Um, this is going to be my last comment before we close out, but um, I have r- really had sort of a... I mean, I don't want to call it a spiritual awakening because, like, a spiritual awakening on capitalism because I, I think that happened a while ago. But um, I had another spiritual <laughs> awakening on how bad capitalism really is. Um, my wife just got a new, um, a new iPad, uh, because she uses her iPad uh, for score reading. It saves paper. It uh, makes it easy so you don't have to turn pages. She has a flip pedal. 
and it's literally uh it's it's something for for her livelihood and you know in in basically for our livelihood it's something that we it's a it's a tool that we need to survive in this world um and she got the the ipad and it's the newest one and um i don't know how many of you have iphones but with the iphone 7 i think uh, yeah, they the, the, they don't have headphone jacks. Though. Yeah, they changed the headphone jack. Well, anyways, they've now changed some of the outlets, uh, like the plugs for the iPad. So you have to buy all these fucking Apple products, and they're not universal. And you know, mm. keep in mind, like keep in mind, like I've gone to foreign countries, I've gone to Hungary, I've gone to Cuba. You know, they have different outlets in all these places. That's a different thing, but. The thing that's so bothersome about this is, all right, I think it's fucking gross that we have to spend all this extra money for a necessity tool for our livelihood. But the yep. deeper thing is, all right, I don't necessarily think that protesting the government fixes anything. It's worth doing. It's, you know, it's something that we have to do. But it hit me, like, how do we protest Apple for the products that they're forcing us to buy because <laughs> yeah it's I, like I, I really thought about this it was like all right like if something bad happens in my life in new york city i can actually like and this this is horrifying because i'm a goddamn anarchist <laughs> like like but it's like i can actually protest uh you know in front of city hall or i can call politicians directly or i can post as many articles as possible on social media or you know can write music to really like affect the culture but how the fuck do you contact apple and tell them that they're they're literally um adding an ex exclusivity uh to to something that honestly we need as for like for survival in the current contemporary world um and it's just dude yeah like, yeah, corporations rule the goddamn world. <laughs> like they, they rule the world more than governments do at this point. Yeah, I was what I was gonna say is, well, it looks like you finally figured out. Although you knew this already, it looks like you finally figured out where the real power is. Yeah, I mean, dude, didn't uh, just, just 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 learn when they figure out that they actually have the power. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they haven't quite figured it out yet. Yeah, I mean, dude, uh, there was just an article. Um, last week about uh a battle between um i think it was Gua uh it was either columbia or um uh why can't it uh, Gua guatemala i was one of one of those countries uh where the military actually lost uh an entire series of battles against the drug cartel and you know the drug cartel is actually more powerful than the government in certain areas um in central and south america and yeah. the thing is like i consider drug cartels to just be capitalists that happen their market happens to be in the black market but they're yes. still there's they're they're still doing what fucking uh, uh kenneth lay did with with enron or 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 what steve jobs did with apple or what jeff bezos yeah, yeah. is doing with amazon it's like yeah it's it's just an illegal market but it's the same shit. Yeah, they use guns because it's an illegal market. But Durin, the difference between a black market and the free market is that the free market people get to write the laws. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's the thing is the black market is apparently starting to be able to write the laws uh, as well. Um, right. In certain parts of the world. But yeah, I, I mean, dude, like you hear any interview with any drug cartel or any mob boss and they talk like fucking businessmen. <laughs> of course like they literally just talk like businessmen well uh, so so dorian now that you've yeah. stepped on at least three of my excellent closing lines <laughs> let's stop all right perfect <laughs> all right well thank you all so much for listening this is tristero pod my name is dorian wallace and this is my friend and colleague uh david coma next week uh at least for podcast listening we're gonna have a badass composer and performance artist on Elizabeth Warren. I don't want to talk about her much. No, no, wrong name. Wrong name. Oh wrong my name. god, did I just say Elizabeth Warren? You did. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Oh my god, it's late when we recorded this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Sorry, Elizabeth Baker. So yeah, we're gonna have Elizabeth Baker on the podcast next week. She is a badass performer, a badass uh, uh, composer, and I don't really want to give her an introduction because I think we just gotta chat with her next week because uh, she is doing some really cool shit. Um, yeah. So sounds good. All right, y'all. See you next week. Yep. See you next week. Peace. <laughs> Let's <laughs> go.